This video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Learn more at expressvpn.com slash wisecrack. You know that this is good acting. You talking to me? You know that this is bad acting. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. Good. I have doubts. <laughs> bad. Oh, hi, Mark. But what the heck is this? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Two R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z! Huh? Here we see Nick Cage in the 1988 film Vampire's Kiss, a performance that spawned 20 million memes. In a film with otherwise normal performances and cinematography, Cage spoke like this. The work's not just gonna go away, Alva. It never just goes away. The god contract is somewhere in those god files! Ran like this. I'm a vampire! I'm a vampire! And ate a live cockroach like this. By the way, we just covered this insanely kind of awesome movie on our movie podcast, Show Me the Meaning. We're actually doing a full month of Nicolas Cage films, so check out the links in the description to join us on this journey into the cagey abyss. Movies like Vampire's Kiss provide some clue as to why Nick Cage's acting career is one of the most disputed of any leading Hollywood star. The tortures of the damned! Some people love the guy. Ethan Hawke calls him the only actor to evolve the craft since Marlon Brando, while David Lynch dubbed him the jazz musician of acting. Now I know what you're thinking. This Nick Cage? Not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! I don't have my eyes! This Nick Cage? The Nick Cage that's motivation for this scene was... My whole motivation here was to try to see how big I could get my eyes. Just to freak her out. Yep. That Nick Cage. Am I fucking rich on In recent years, Cage has become just as well known for the ridiculous memes he inspires as the roles he plays. Leaving us movie lovers at Wisecrack really and truly befuddled. So today in this Wisecrack edition, we're asking, Nicolas Cage, deep or dumb? Let's investigate. Who is Nick Cage anyway? Nephew of director Francis Ford Coppola, Cage is arguably one of the hardest working actors in Hollywood, with over 73 films in his repertoire. The guy's also pretty bad with money, which may have something to do with his apparent inability to turn down any paying gig. He's an unusual Hollywood leading man, having appeared in Stinkers, weirdly great indie films, big action films, and everything in between. His refusal to be typecast also makes him difficult to wrap your head around. He's basically half leading man, half character actor. To understand Nicolas Cage and this, we need to put him in the broader context of film performance history. When the first silent narrative films started being made, they drew largely from the most popular performance entertainment of the time theater, and particularly the genres of melodrama and vaudeville. Both forms called for large, sweeping gestures that could be as easily understood in the balcony as in the front row. This tradition was coupled with the limitations of the silent film genre, which had zero verbal communication other than this fancy typeset. Actors had only their faces and their bodies to work with. That meant a lot of wide eyes, ugly crying, and berserko gestures. It wasn't realistic, and it didn't try to be. Then in the late 1920s, talkie films with synchronized sound started becoming technologically and commercially viable. Suddenly, actors were forced to rethink their entire craft, a crisis best encapsulated by this moment in Singing in the Rain, in which a famous silent film actor clumsily attempts to translate his craft into the new era of sound. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> Did somebody get paid for writing that dialogue? Change was slow, and movies of the 1930s typically show stars expressing a heightened reality that harkens back to their silent film roots. You ain't mad at me, men, are you? No! I ain't mad at you. Importantly, just a few years earlier, America had been introduced to the groundbreaking techniques of Konstantin Stanislavsky, a Russian acting coach whose ideas about realism would eventually be turned into method acting. Basically, Stanislavski and method acting attempt to help actors channel emotional truth from within. Hey, Stella! As these techniques became adapted from theater to film, actors began turning their characters into fully rounded people, and sometimes 
briefly living as those people, like Daniel Day-Lewis who spent the entire production of My Left Foot in a wheelchair. These antics were eventually packaged as publicity gold, which is why Leo almost froze to death and why Jared Leto mailed out dead pig heads. Anyway, Method's emphasis on realism, coupled with the enhanced realism offered by sound film, congealed in the 40s and 50s and swept Hollywood. Actors like Marlon Brando became famous for disappearing into a character. While there have certainly been ripples of other directing and acting styles, such as the dementedly over-the-top campy performances seen in John Waters' films, Someone will pay with our life for this grossly offensive act! Mama, nobody sends you a turn expects to live. Nobody! There's remained an overwhelming emphasis on realism as the goal of acting for film. We typically award Oscars to actors who have disappeared into their roles, frequently while portraying real people. Which is all well and good, except when we become dogmatic about it. Cinema scholar Carol Zucker argues that the idea that acting for film should adhere to a standard of gestural and psychological verisimilitude, i.e. realness or trueness, suggests a limited vision of performance. Basically, what if the dominance of realism in acting has left us with a narrow vision of what acting can be? Is the reason Nick Cage performances look so weird because he falls outside this view? That's the persuasive argument made by author Lindsay Gibb in National Treasure, her book-long love letter to the actor. Gibb recounts the way Nick Cage originally embraced method acting, even having two teeth removed for his role as the injured veteran in 1984's Birdie. But Cage quickly tired of the style. Thus began the truly Cagean search for a form of acting that went beyond. It's too not late. late! Too late! It's too late! late. It's too in 1990, he told American Film, I wanted to put back into acting a more surreal or experimental style that wasn't totally run by literalism, which seemed like a dead end. Cage considers Vampire's Kiss to have been the laboratory for the new ideas he was toying with, a low-stakes indie setting where he could experiment, play, and recite his A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Sorry, we really love that scene. I never misspelled anything! In Vampire's Kiss, we start to see the Nick Cage we've come to know and mean. There you are! He makes bold, daring choices that take advantage of all aspects of his physicality, including some patently goofy facial expressions. While we're accustomed to seeing some of this broad style acting in every era of screwball comedy, Cage would go on to employ it fearlessly, whether he's working in melodrama, action, or horror. Glass or plastic! Glass or plastic! He is unapologetically performative. While that quality proves confusing for the viewer in naturalistic films like Vampire's Kiss, it tends to work really well in movies that push the limits of reality, movies set in surreal worlds that can accommodate his bold choices. Take Cage's bombastic performance in Moonstruck, which is fitting for a film preoccupied with the dramatics of opera. As Ronnie, the long-estranged brother of Teresa's fiancé Johnny, Cage expresses a volatility that is captivating to watch. I lost my hand! I lost my bride! Johnny has his hand! Johnny has his bride! Over 30 years later in Mandy, Cage gives an unrestrained heavy metal performance only appropriate for an LSD-fueled film featuring a sword boner. Similarly, in the dream world of David Lynch's Wild at Heart, Cage's outrageous, brain-bashing Elvis crooning sailor feels right at home. This is a snakeskin jacket. And for me, it's a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom. Cage's dialed-up style can work, provided the filmmaker and the other actors are in on it. Cage's outrageous antics lead many a critic to deem him out of control or over the top. <laughs> but understanding how he approaches his craft kind of changes everything. Cage is incredibly thoughtful and incredibly well-versed in the craft of acting. Some of his most famously ridiculous moments are planned out, move by move by move. Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! John! Fuck you! Take the famous alphabet recitation, of which Cage says every one of those moves, each hand clap, hip thrust, pout, and holler was carefully thought and planned out. 
At other times, Cage takes inspiration from Kabuki, a Japanese avant-garde performance art that combines acting, dancing, and singing with extreme stylization. That's probably where Cage's tendency to ad-lib made-up lyrics comes from, best seen in this drunken interlude in Leaving Las Vegas. Like the cling clang king of the rim ram room. Gibb argues that what Cage calls his Western Kabuki style and its appreciation for the hyper-performative is the reason he tends to adopt a different voice for every character he plays. I said, put the bunny back in the box. For his own part, Cage says his vocal experimentation has been an attempt to use his voice in an almost heavy metal or operatic or baroque way. Have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and beat until you pissed blood? Indeed, it doesn't get more heavy metal than his screaming scenes in Mandy. Cage's insane attention to the details of body movements is the reason his characters and adaptation feel so persuasively different. Cage plays twin brothers who represent the two sides of screenwriter Charlie Kaufman's personality. Charlie is a neurotic, chronic overthinker obsessed with making genuine art, while Donald is the charismatic Hollywood sellout. Fittingly, they move like two entirely different people, an affect Cage says he created by adjusting his spine. For Charlie's rigid and controlled movements, Cage hunched over and tensed up, while he straightened his back and loosened up to portray the more go-with-the-flow Donald. At other points, Cage draws inspiration from German Expressionism, commonly viewed as the first real film movement, which explored the horrors of post-World War I life in Germany through highly emotional, subjective storytelling. Dreamlike horror films defined the genre, depicting nightmarish worlds filled with twisted, terrifying villains. These films left a lasting impact on the film world, influencing genres like film noir, horror, and even graphic novels like Sin City. Nick Cage isn't one to miss out on the fun. In interviews, he's described watching classic German expressionist films like Nosferatu and Metropolis as a kid, and described the way certain distinct hand motions, like this famous gesture in Moonstruck, were inspired by those films. At other times, he's modeled the character's physical attributes off characters from German expressionist films. Other times, he'll take things to a more mystical level. Take his role as Johnny Blaze in Ghost Rider, a performance that was widely panned. Gibb describes how Cage adopted what he calls Novu Shamanism, in which he integrated Afro-Caribbean techniques and sewed thousand-year-old Egyptian artifacts into his clothing. He also prepared by painting his face white and black like a voodoo priest. All these techniques were meant to trick him into thinking he's a character from another dimension with special powers. Now, keep in mind, this was all in preparation for this role. <laughs> Rather than phoning in his superhero turn, Cage decided to push the boundaries of what is comfortable. For his Oscar-winning performance in Leaving Las Vegas, Cage studied cinema's most convincing alcoholics and even hired a drunk actor to hang out with him in his trailer. As a constant student of the craft, he takes on roles not because they'll improve his reputation, clearly. Oh, you Instead, he tries radically new genres, roles, and pulls from new influences. Whether he's channeling ancient vampires or even more ancient shamans, Nicolas Cage defiantly refuses to conform to realism, drawing into question why that's even a benchmark for our understanding of good acting. We don't fault the song Yellow Submarine for unrealistically depicting the aquatic life. Modernist authors like Virginia Woolf are deemed revolutionary for the way their highly stylized novels depict life in the abstract, creating unreliable timelines and dreamlike narratives. Meanwhile, musicians like Arnold Schoenberg and John Cage are considered geniuses for breaking every rule of normal music making. So why do we consider a departure from realism to be an explicitly bad thing only when it comes to acting? Well, we'll venture a guess. Film with its close-ups and point of view shots is arguably the most intimate art form. When we so closely identify with a central character, we naturally expect the performer to behave approximately the way that we would. Part of why Nick Cage can be so maddening to watch is that he specifically refuses to do just that. <laughs> well, I think you better pull the trigger, because I don't give a f He's also generally working with people who don't ascribe to his acting philosophy, like if a death metal singer subbed in at his local church choir. His wild reactions and bug-eyed expressions confuse our expectations. 
They also make for particularly ridiculous moments that, in a meme which erases the context of the film, makes his performance seem ridiculous. But what if there are actual merits to his out there performance style? Compare Nicolas Cage's Peter in Vampire's Kiss to Christian Bale's charismatic and murderous Patrick Bateman in American Psycho. While both films are poking fun at the corporate yuppie culture of the 80s, Bale's Bateman has become an iconic anti-hero who is weirdly revered and perversely admired for his highly specific brand of social status obsessiveness. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my God. It even has a watermark. In comparison, Cage's Peter is so inaccessible, so clearly performative, that he runs no risk of becoming sympathetic to the audience. <laughs> Still, there's a reason we're talking about Nick Cage and not, say, Chris Pratt's acting style. It's compelling, it's different, it's controversial. And ultimately, it's subjective. You have every right to consider this ridiculous or to consider it totally awesome. Either way, we'd argue that with a few more Nick Cages, Hollywood might just be a lot more interesting. You don't have to be president of your local Nick Cage fan club to construe value in what he's doing. In fact, you can straight up find him absurd. No matter what, you gotta admit, he's pretty interesting. So what do you think? Is Nick Cage deep or dumb? Let us know what you think in the comments. Well, it could prove to be useful information, maybe! And hey, if you value your security and secrecy on the internet, then I really recommend this video sponsor, ExpressVPN. If you don't know, a VPN is a virtual private network. It allows you to surf the web safely and privately by routing your connection through a server and hiding your online actions. That means you can do things like access videos that might not be available in your country or have security when logging into those sketchy public Wi-Fi hotspots. Seriously, with all the sketchy stuff going down on the web, getting a VPN has been a big source of relief for me. Plus, you don't want the feds or your FBI agent on Andre knowing you've streamed every episode of Honey Boo Boo. So take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three months free by going to expressvpn.com slash wisecrack or clicking the link in the description. Try ExpressVPN today for less than $7 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash wisecrack. Thanks for watching guys, peace.